Olá a todos, boa tarde. Vamos dar início à sessão dessa tarde, do segundo dia do nosso evento. E agora nós temos nosso segundo palestrante convidado. I'm very happy to introduce you to Ricardo Finger. <risos> é, Ricardo Finger, ele é pesquisador da Universidade do Chile e tem colaborado com, no, com, com a gente no Brasil, principalmente no projeto Llama. And Ricardo will talk about astronomical instrumentation at University of, of Chile. So, Thank you very much. I will stand. Maybe hand wave. Okay. Um, I will talk about the astronomical instrumentation effort at the University of Chile, but I particularly focus on two projects. One project is a receiver we're building for the Yama telescope, and a second project is a pet project, if you want, a small project, but uh, a very interesting one, which is a receiver, highly digitized receiver, a receiver which is basically inside of a single process or more than uh, on, a, on, on, on the telescope itself. So let's, let's begin with an introduction to Chile or to the Atacama Desert. I always want to do this the nose. Uh, but what you have to know is that uh, the driest desert in the world is in the north of Chile. Uh, we have this uh, Humboldt current here coming from the pole, which brings very cold water to the whole Chilean coast which is very bad for beach going because there is no place to, to dive in, in, in Chile without not getting frozen immediately. But it's very good for astronomy because there is no water vapor coming out of the, of the sea. And even if you have a little bit of water vapor coming out of the sea, that water vapor gets immediately trapped in the hills from the sea up to the mountains because that right there you have a first mountain range a coastal mountain range, much smaller than the Andes, but big enough to turn off that uh, moisture into, into clouds immediately. So it gets condensed here at the, at the coast, and no water at all goes into, into the desert, into the mainland. Okay? So I, I work in, in the VLA, the very large array in New Mexico, and they call it in the US the New Mexico Desert, but actually when you walk through the New Mexico Desert, it's just full of life, uh, there are bushes everywhere, there are cactus, there are foxes, there are mice, uh, I don't know, rattlesnakes, wherever. So it's, uh, when, when I look at the New Mexico desert, uh, when I work there, I say this is not a desert. I mean, this is a desert, this is the real thing of the desert. In, in, the, in the Atacama desert, you can stand on top of the mountain and I look all around, up to the horizon, like 50 kilometers around, and find no form of life whatsoever, not a fly, not a mosquito. Okay, so dry that actually the Mars rover was tested in the Atacama Desert. So, okay, no good for life, but very good for astronomy. And the Atacama Desert, uh, uh, well, even though it's, it's up here in, in, in the north, still it's pretty dry all the way down to La Serena. Um, in La Serena was the first place that was identified as a very good place for astronomy in the 60s. And the first large telescope in the southern hemisphere was installed in that, in that area in La Serena, it's called Cerro Tololo, a well-known uh, observatory uh, by the Americans. Shortly after, in the 69, uh, we have La Silla uh, uh, Observatory, uh, which is European, uh, also a very large one, the largest on, of its kind at that time, close also to La Serena. Then, 71, just a few years later, Carnegie, also from the US, install uh, Las Campanas. So in a very short period of time, we have three very large telescopes, the largest telescope in the Southern Hemisphere, and also the largest telescopes in the world, installed in close to La Serena. So a big, giant leap for Chile in, in well, astronomy. And also in that area, but 30 years later, pretty much, a Gemini a Observatory was also installed here in, in, in close to La Serena. Okay. But in the last 20 years, a second hub, if you want, of telescope has been installed in the northern part of Chile, which is close to Antofagasta, now in the, in the very heart of the Atacama Desert. So this is the very large telescope. Actually, these are four telescopes. Each of these telescopes is as powerful as 
the older four observatories. So in one hit, one telescope, uh, install as much collecting area, as much astronomical power, if you want, in one single shot here at the Antofagasta region, Antofagasta region. That is called the Very Large Telescope from ESO. So we double the power of the uh, astronomical instrument just in one shot with the VL, VLT. And around the same time, two Pathfinder experiments were installed very high up in the mountain. So this is, this is uh, well about 2,000 meters. This is about six, uh, five, five to six thousand meters. Um, and two Pathfinders were installed, which were these two radio telescopes, uh, Apex and Aste, to prove the site that will later become the site of ALMA. So finally, ALMA was installed there uh, here up. So, well, this is a very short history of um, the development of uh, an installation of uh, observatories in Chile. And there, is, um, there are many more to come. Uh, this is one of the most famous ones. It's the e extremely European Extremely Large Telescope, uh, 39 meter in diameter, and it's under construction right now, uh, very close to the VLT in, uh, in Antofagasta. In Antofagasta. Uh, supposed to be operational for 2025, but I think that number was before the pandemic, so add three, four years to that. Uh, this is the size of the mirror. It's a segmented mirror. It's absolutely massive. Um, so it's pretty much the same technology that the that ALMA telescope has or YAMA telescope will have. So it's segmented. And you have to align each segment in order to get your parabola uh, at, at your required accuracy. But this is just overwhelming. It's a super large project. Uh, this one is less known. But it's a very interesting one, because this is, it, well, it, it was called uh, originally LSST, Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. Today it's called the Rubin Observatory, Vera Rubin Observatory. But it's a very interesting telescope, because it's exotic design. The primary mirror and the secondary mirror are about the same size. So it's kind of a eight meters and six meters. So they are, they are very similar. And the reason for that is that uh, you want to have a very large field of view, extremely large field of view, many, many degrees around. And it has a camera that it uh, can what, do fast exposures, but a very deep one. So they, it's very sensitive, but it's also fast at the same time. So fast and sensitive that can take a picture of the whole sky, or the whole southern sky, but more than half of the sky, the, the whole sky, every two days. So it will actually, if you want, produce a movie of the sky, a very slow motion movie, or, or high motion movie, I would say fast motion movie, because it's one frame every two days. But it, that has never been done before. So we, we have never done before in astronomy uh, a movie of the sky, even if it's uh, one frame every, every two days. So the discoveries waiting for this telescope are I impossible to predict. So we will have a lot of information we have never had. The only thing we can predict is that it will discover many supernovae per year. That, that is something we already know, because supernovae searches are science that has been done in the last two decades. So we, we know approximately how many of them should be discovered by this telescope. But there are many other things we don't know. All the universe, uh, let's say the transient universe, the universe that is changing in time, will be bring to us by this observatory. Also, it will produce a huge amount of data, terabytes per night that need to be processed. Um, so this, there is a large challenge uh, and, and a very interesting challenge for people interested in computing uh, well, uh, artificial intelligence, pattern searching, and everything related with that. OK, that's LSST. Also two less known telescope, but very interesting one. The TAO is the Tokyo Atacama Observatory. This is a 6.5 meter, very <coughs> large for the altitude in which it will be. So this will be the highest telescope or ground-based telescope in the world. Um, actually, it's the highest building or the highest technical building. I think that the only highest building ex in existence in the world is a train station in the Tibet. So this will be like the highest construction, if you want, um, in, in the world. 
at 5,640 meters, and it's a, it will be an infrared telescope. And CCATP, which is submillimeter, also very high, pretty much at the same high, which is a survey telescope, very wide field of view, too, uh, multi-pixel receivers in submillimeter frequencies. So, as you can see, many other telescopes are coming to Chile in the next, in the next years. And this is one that was uh, presented yesterday here in this workshop. It's a giant Magellan telescope, very, very large too. Not as large as the ELT, but super large anyway. So it's a 24 meter uh, telescope where uh, eight meters is kind of a, the standard for professional super top telescopes. And this is 24. So it's kind of a moving the standard really uh, together with the ELT to a new area of huge telescope. Okay, CTA was also presented yesterday in this workshop, and it will come also to Chile in the next years, close to the, the DLT. This is a gamma ray telescope. Well, you, you already got the information about this one. So, okay, and this one is not gonna be in Chile, but it will be pretty close to Chile, and not only geographically, but also uh, in collaboration with Chile. So, uh, it is here too in the list, okay? This, well, this picture is from Apex, uh, which is antenna, which is very similar to, to what YAMA will be. Um, and as Jack says today in the morning, uh, well, pretty close to ALMA. Okay, so in summary, uh, in a few years from now, we will have 70% of world's collecting area for astronomy in one single country, which is a big responsibility, I guess. If you, pretty much everybody knows Chile because of copper production, we are the first copper producers in, in the world, but actually we produce about the 30%, 28% of uh, global copper production. Then a lot of other countries made up the other 70%. But in astronomy, we, we will be the 70% of astronomical data production, so it will be much more than copper. Right? We, should, we should be known for astronomy production more than copper production. One, of course, one. Huh? Very important one. Uh, okay, so what we do with this, with this opportunity? Uh, well, two ways to exploit this opportunity. First, science, of course. And the uh, Department of Astronomy, University of Chile, where, uh, where I am professor, it has uh, many research areas. So from extragalactic, active galactic nuclei, a stellar population, star formation, ISM, uh, extrasolar planets, brown dwarf, uh, supernovae and dark energy. Uh, also, we, we collaborate with a supernova search that was the one third of the data used to prove the accelerated expansion of the universe and worth a Nobel Prize, and astronomical instrumentation. So what is, uh, I will cover today. Okay, in astronomical instrumentation, uh, we have a laboratory, the Millimeter Way Laboratory, uh, and it's a joint effort uh, of astronomy and electrical engineers. So it's a laboratory that actually hosts students from astronomy and electrical engineer. Uh, we develop front-end and back-end, meaning receivers, cryogenic receivers or non-cryogenic receivers, centimeter, millimeter wave receivers, but analog if you want. This is front-end in this, in this Hergon, it's the analog part, and back-end is all, all the digital single processors, which we also develop in-house at the laboratory. And we train undergraduates and graduate students, and we do also technology transfer through collaboration with industry, or try to do. Um, so this is our uh, 1.2 meter telescope we have in Cerro Galán. Uh, it's a, it looks like an optical telescope, but it's a high frequency radio telescope. That is why it looks like optical, but it's, it's not optical. It's uh, focusing, observing CO. CO is a molecule, it's carbon monoxide. It's a molecule which in, in the earth you don't want to breathe because it's poisonous. Uh, but in space, it's a very useful molecule because it's very bright, it's easy to excite, and, you, and it's a good tracer of many things. So when you find CO, you find hydrogen, and you can trace the molecular uh, well, content of the galaxy and beyond. So uh, a very important line that covers this, this telescope in, in Cerro Galán. Well, many of you have been in Cerro Galán. Uh, so if not, you are invited to go. We are 16 people. Uh, four professors, uh, four electrical engineers, two mechanical engineers. At this moment, four graduate students in electrical engineering, two postdocs, one in astronomy and one in electrical engineer. But these numbers here, the last two uh, rows, are changing year to year, of course. But more or less, 
that is the, the, size, the size of the team. Okay. All right, so in order to, uh, to talk to you about the collaboration we have with Yama, I have to do a very brief introduction to, to the Alma front end, to what is an Alma receiver, in order to give you content. So allow me to just uh, go through a few slides uh, about Alma receivers. We saw also this uh, slide in, in the morning. So this is the transmission of the atmosphere at Chaknantor, at, the, at, at this site, this plateau at 5,000 meters above the sea level. So you can see that you have places where you have good transmission and places where you have no transmission at all. And you have to place receivers in order to well, detect astronomical signals in all these bands. But at the, at the first look, at well, first glance, when you look at these receivers, it's kind of uh, odd. You have these receiver, very broadband receivers here, or it looks like if they were broadband, and a kind of narrow band receivers here. And why you don't put a receiver like band 10 here to cover like one band 2, 3, and 4, as an example? Well, the point is, it's not important really the absolute bandwidth of a receiver. The important thing is the percentage bandwidth of a receiver. So how much the receiver covers in respect to the central frequency of the receiver. So that figure is the important figure. And if you look at this plot again, but thinking on that figure, so percentage bandwidth, so absolute bandwidth divided by central frequency, the picture is completely different. As an example, band 10 has a 19% bandwidth. So this, this uh, width here is 19% of the central frequency of operation. Okay? If you look at band 6, it's 26. If you look at band 9 here, it's 18. And if you look at band 1, which is that very small one, it's actually 35% of bandwidth. So actually, the, the wider band receiver is band 1, not band 10. Uh, in the sense that it's the most difficult to build uh, because all the optics, amplifiers, and everything has to be very wideband with respect to the central frequency. So this is the way you should look at this plot. And that is why, that is the reason why Alma didn't put a receiver this bandwidth here. Because if, if you try to make a receiver this bandwidth, it's impossible. It's like 200% fractional bandwidth. It's not, it's engineering-wise, it's impossible to build. So you have to have a small receiver for each, for each band, for each atmospheric band. That's the reason why you have all these receivers here. OK, by the way, most of this absorption you, hear, you see here is because of water vapor, uh, which is a uh, well, polar molecule, as you know. So it has many uh, resonant modes. So it absorbed uh, a lot of radiation in this band. OK, um, so in the original ALMA plan, there were two receivers well, to cover this window here this atmosphere window, band two and band three. So keep that in mind because I will come back to that. All right, so ALMA is this beautiful interferometer which has 12 meter antennas, 66 12 meter antennas with panels that you have to align 25, below 25 micrometer uh, accuracy after alignment, so just a perfect parabola uh, if you want. And primary secondary mirror and the Cassegrain grain aperture here and the receivers are in the back here, in the, in the cabin. And all those receivers are inside of the same cryostat. And this is, this is the cryostat. This is called the ALMA front end. So this is the whole heart, if you want, of each ALMA antenna. It's what is detected radiation coming from the sky and turn it into, into a, a signal that can be digitized and analyzed by computers. So here we're putting the receiver inside the, the ALMA cabin. And it looks like this. So this is a cryostat. It's a refrigerator that uh, goes down to 4 Kelvin, so pretty much 270 degrees below zero Celsius. And uh, so all the receivers are plugged into this cryostat from below. And all, all of them has the same shape, the same form factor, the same mechanical design, if you want. And this is very important because before ALMA, there was no standard on building receivers. So everybody builds a receiver their own way, no, not really following any standard. But when ALMA came into place, of course, it has to standardize everything because it has 66 antennas and 66 times 10 receivers is what just too much. You have to build a standard, something you can plug and plug, swap, maintain in a reasonable way. So ALMA designed 
this standard from scratch and says, okay, everybody that builds receivers from Alma has to complain with this standard, has to fit the receiver into this cartridge. And that is called, uh, that is why it's called the Alma cartridges. So these are type of cartridges that get plugged into the front end and from below, you, you plug them in and you, s you well, open these windows and you see through these windows and the receiver is, is underneath inside of the cryostat, okay? And this was a revolution because no, n never before we have a standard in radio astronomy in which you can build receivers and those receivers can be swapped. So many telescopes beyond ALMA began to use this standard, like, well, Apex, ASTE, Greenland Telescope, now will be YAMA. So it's, it's something that didn't exist before. Please. No, it depends. In the, it, de it depends on the band. So higher bands use quartz windows. Uh, lower frequency bands use HDPE, so polyethylene, plastic. Uh, and mylar is used, but in the waveguides uh, feed throughs, vacuum feed throughs here, but not in the in the windows on top. Uh, good. So these are the cartridges. These are the receivers and. And this is also a cartridge, but this goes on below these cartridges, and this is the local oscillator. This additional electronics you need to, 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 to use these receivers, okay? Not important at this moment. Okay, what we did, uh, well, we have done many things for ALMA, but this is kind of the flagship project of the last decade of our laboratory, which was built ALMA Band 1, which was one of the bands that did, did not come with ALMA originally in the first proposal, in the first, uh, first slide of ALMA. And we work uh, in a team, in a consortium with uh, Japan and well, Canada and NRIO to build this receiver. Particularly our work package was the optics. So we have to develop these optics, uh, which has never been de developed before because it's, it's a 35% bandwidth, again, which is very difficult to achieve. So in order to, to build a horn and infrared filters and a lens that is able to work in such a wide band, you have to come back to the books, to the optics books, to come back to, to, to really from scratch. You have to start designing from zero, uh, put in a computer, solve the Maxwell equations, do the simulation, the electromagnetic simulation, find your result, find that the result is not satisfactory, come back to, to the drawing board and do that iteration many times. Uh, this lens has thousands of hours of computer time of uh, just uh, simulating electromagnetic equations. Computers that, by the way, has to have very large memories. So in, in order to design this lens, we, we, we use a computer with 128 gigabytes of memory, and we, we were always at 90% of, of, of usage of, of RAM memory. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a complex process, but at the end you convert in some solution, you build it, you measure, and probably you come back to the drawing board again a couple of times, and then you have your optics. And we did that for years, for about three years, and at the end we had a, a design that we could present to ALMA um, with the data to show that we are meeting the specification. So ALMA accepted, so we could build it for the whole observatory. So we built 80 lenses and 80 horns and infrared filters, so all the optics component, for, for the whole observatory. Mm -hmm. This is uh, well, one of the largest projects we have, we have done, but we have made many smaller projects uh, uh, at component level, like developing an, uh, an amplifier, or so developing a mixer, uh, smaller uh, uh, well, developments of, of a specific, a specific components. But this is kind of a, the largest project. Okay, now that you know what ALMA is, what an ALMA cartridge is, uh, and that YAMA is very similar to one on an antenna, I can uh, tell you about our project in collaboration with YAMA, which is the building of the YAMA band 2 plus 3. So the point is, ALMA was designed in the 90s, and so it, when, when it was designed, the technology was not capable of actually observing uh, such a wide band, like 50, 54% of fractional bandwidth. It was just not possible. 30 was the most you can do in the 90s. So uh, across the whole project, the bands were, were designed uh, based on, on that restriction. But with current technology, you can go for wider bandwidth. Uh, the reason is 
it's large to, uh, a little longer to explain because it changed the technology. Uh, at the time, in the 90s, it was not possible to use amplifiers at high frequencies, so you have to use what is called superconducted mixers, but now you can design amplifiers that works well at these bands. So an amplifier is a wider uh, band than, than SIS mixers. So long story short, we can do, or we hope we can do, 54% of bandwidth at this moment. So uh, we decide to, to go for joining those, those two ALMA bands together. And this has a lot of advantages for everybody, for ALMA, but for any other telescope that will use ALMA cartridges. So the idea will be to put everything together in one cartridge, but with the, elect the electronics uh, capable of covering these two bands, but without sacrificing performance. And that is a very important point. So we will do as good as ALMA band three, but covering band two and three. So the, the will, there will be no sacrifice. And that is important because you can always trade bandwidth and noise, as an example. When, when you're designing an amplifier, you can do, okay, I want a larger bandwidth amplifier, but it will sacrifice noise. That is not too difficult. But when you want to keep noise level at some level and increase bandwidth, that is a whole different story. So that is our promise, to, to do band two plus three without sacrificing a noise temperature. Okay, this project, just to have some numbers in, in, in the head, is uh, a total cost is 500 kilo USD. It will be shared uh, in these percentages. So University of Chile is 300 kilo, uh, Yama uh, in uh, EAJ is 100 kilo, and uh, Chinese Academy of Science is 100 kilo USD. Total, including manpower, including value observing time, including everything. So this is in-kind and in-cash. If you want to go to the in-cash, those are more or less the fraction of in-cash uh, contribution of the different institutes. Okay, this was presented to Chilean ANID, which is like a FAPES, but a tenth of it. And, um, and we got funded uh, by, by ANID. And what, well, China uh, is interesting in how many receiver because they are also well, using ALMA standards in, 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 in new telescopes. Okay, so uh, how this receiver would look like? It would look like an ALMA cartridge, of course. Uh, it would have uh, many components, horns. Uh, this is dual pole receiver, so it has to have an orthomotor transducer, so a polarization splitter, if you want, which is there. Then you go th down through different receiver chains where you place, f the, f the first thing you place is the low noise amplifiers here. Everything here is cooled down to 15 Kelvin. And then a second amplification stage uh, around here. And then you go right through out of the cryostat. If you can go out of the cryostat immediately, you want to do it. So you don't want to have too many things inside of vacuum and at cold if you can have it at warm. So we will, we will have only the amplifiers in the, in, in here in the, in the cold cartridge and then go out with the RF out, uh, 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 out of the vacuum and have the rest of the, of the receiver here. So keep, keep this number in, 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 in mind. So we want to achieve 60 Kelvin over 80% of the band and 90 Kelvin over 100% of the band. These are the other numbers, uh, just to have it there. The, import, the scientific importance of this band is, is very, very large. So it's, uh, I mean, you, you, you can do many, many science cases with this band. I put just a few here to have an idea. So evolution, of course, in molecular clouds, all these species can be, can be detected. So these are different molecules that can be detected by this, by this band. A star formation and galactic structure, ion molecule chemistry, another list of molecules that can be detected to this science case, molecular spectroscopy, complex prebiotic organic molecules, red shifted CO and HCN, you name it. And also, it's an excellent receiver for first light because you have the CO line in the middle of the receiver. And the CO line, as I said at the beginning of the talk, is a very, very bright, strong line, which is everywhere in the galaxy. So you can, you, you have a lot of sources, well-known, well-characterized sources. You can look at it to, to do your science and commission and verification. Okay, so it's a, it's a very versatile receiver, if you want. Right, so the cold cartridge, the part that goes into the vacuum and in cold, will have the horn antenna, infrared filter, or well, the vacuum window, of course, polarization splitter, and the amplifiers, the two amplifier stages. Then we go, we, here's the break of the vacuum, and here everything is cold in the, here is in the warm cartridge, which is just normal warm temperature 
uh, room temperature electronics, okay? Which will we have, uh, uh, well, the mixers, additional amplification, and then goes out to the, to the digitizers. And of course, the local oscillator in order to provide a, well, reference to those mixers, okay? So that, that is how it looks. All right, so this is um, Yamaha Van Tupper 3. What we have done so far, so this is the first year of this project. It's a two-year project that it can be extended up to three at most, uh, but at least in paper it should be two. Uh, we have this first chain here, receiver chain already assembled into a test cryostat. So this is not put together into an Alma cartridge yet, but it's, it's, on, it's just in a, in a test cryostat inside of uh, just connected to this plate here, uh, which is uh, a cryostat. So here is the horn. This is the OMT, so horn, horn, OMT, OMT. And here we go to the first amplifier, that one is the first amplifier. And then we go to the second amplifier. We skip the solator for this, for this, uh, for this measurement. And this is the result. So uh, gain is, 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 is very high, but more important, noise temperature is within a spec. So we have, this is our simulation for noise temperature, and this is our measurement. There are two different measurements. The difference between the two measurements are just different bias points for the amplifiers. So when you change a little bit the bias of the amplifier, you actually you can change the performance uh, quite a bit. But the important point is that with the proper tuning of the amplifiers, we could get to the blue curve, and the blue curve is below 60 Kelvin for 80% of the band and below 90 Kelvin for 100% of the band, which is the ALMA specifications for AMBAL band 3. So, so far, we are meeting the promise of uh, providing a receiver twice as wideband with the same performance of ALMA, okay? All right, uh, mechanically speaking, we have also manufactured already a large part of the cartridge body. So this is, uh, that will be this cartridge body. So we have now to put this, well, to duplicate this chain, to have another chain, hopefully with the same performance, and this to put, then to put everything into this cartridge body. That will be done the first semester of the next year. Hopefully by the end, we will have a receiver to show you. Okay, that was YAMA, band two plus three, uh, our main project that we have in collaboration with, with you guys here in Brazil. And I want to finish the presentation with this uh, smaller project, but a uh, one that I, I particularly like, because it's this kind of experiments that are low cost, but they can have like a, 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 a big impact if you, if you just make it. And it's, this is a, a exotic telescope, it's an experiment, it works between two, one and two gigahertz, so it's low frequency, it's centimeter wavelength. And it has a very strange antenna. You see the antenna doesn't look like, like anything you see normally in radio telescopes. Why so? It's because of this. This antenna is designed to cover one particular part of the sky, which is the galactic center, and the, let's say, the Milky Way, right in, uh, in, in the center and beyond, but where the maximum density of, well, of everything pretty much, of matter, of, 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 of stars, and of pulsars in particular are. So we designed this antenna in order to have a very elongated beam, um, which we can position here at the center of the galaxy and cover uh, well the, the co cover a big chunk of the Milky Way, including the galactic center, and covering most of the pulsar. Why we want to see so many pulsars at the same time? Because it is thought that the news, a new source that, ex that was discovered about a, a decade ago, which are the fast radio bursts, that are flashes of radio light, if you want, that are coming everywhere from the galaxy, that may be caused by one particular type of pulsars which are called magnetars. And one every, I don't know, couple thousand pulsars become magnetar, and uh, those magnetars can produce these flashes once every, I don't know, some time. So if we look at a big chunk of pulsars for a long enough time, like a year, in our own galaxy, we may see a couple of them to flash in this fast rovers. And since they are in, the, in our own galaxy, they should be very bright. So they will be a very, very bright flash. So it could be detected by a small antenna. 
So this is the whole bit of this experiment. We have a small antenna, but super wide, band, super, super wide field of view. It's 900 square degrees. May not tell you too much that, but it's a huge field of view. And ultra fast time resolution. So we are digitizing at high speed, and, and so we, we, we can see anything that happens in the sky, even if it happens in microseconds time. So it's a, it's a niche experiment, if you want. We are covering a special part, very small part, of the parameter space in which wide field of view, ultra fast time resolution may give us the edge to, to have a detection of a fast, fast radio burst inside of our own galaxy. So the, why I like this project so much is because it's fully digital. The, the receivers are not complex, are commercial, actually. You have all the parts of the receiver, you can, you can buy them commercially. But the whole telescope is actually not in the receiver itself, but in the signal processing. We do beamforming, so we have three antennas. And the three antennas we have, we use two of them to do the beam. This elongated beam is done adding two of these antenna arrays. But we have a third antenna array, and the third antenna array is used to locate the source. Because these two, these two antennas here allows you to locate the source in, in one of the galactic coordinates, but you need a third antenna to locate the source in the other, in L and B, if you want. So there is another algorithm running all the time, which is a direction of arrival algorithm, that every time there is a trigger, it, it tells you where, where it happens, with some error, but at least more or less, it tells you it happens in this, in this place in the galaxy. So we have beam forming, we have direction of arrival, which are, uh, which are uh, digital processing algorithms that are used in telecommunication normally. Uh, 5G uses direction of arrival in order to point beams into the different uh, users. Um, and we have RFI, we have a different antenna just to, to check RFI. Here is the reference antenna. And we use all those information, direction of arrival, uh, well, the dispersion and RFI ranking in order to trigger or not to trigger a detection. So, it's, so as you can see, the real part of the telescope is in the digital domain, no, not, not as much in the receiver uh, or the antenna, but inside of, of the FPGA. Uh, this produces two time of data products. One data product is just a continuum log. So every time 10 milliseconds, we, we just record a log. So we have a spectrum every, every 10 milliseconds. And when we have a trigger, when we have a detection, we dump all the data we have from the ADCs. So this is, this is 2.25 gigabytes per trigger. But this is raw data. So this ADC output data. So this is sub-microsecond accuracy, sub-microsecond time resolution, if you want, data, in which you can do whatever you want offline with this data for each trigger. And this one is just a log you have there. You can look afterwards if, if, if there is some detection. Well, this log produces 10 gigabit per hour, and the dumps produces 2.5 gigabit per event. So actually, we're getting a lot of data already, and we don't know how to analyze it, because yet um, well, we, we don't have yet a way to analyze this data automatically. So what we do, believe it or not, is that we produce hundreds of these spectrograms per day and we just go through the spectrograms like, like this in the computer, looking at looking at spectrograms to see if we, if we see something, okay? Of course, you are thinking of, at this moment, you are thinking of pattern recognition and, and, and whatever, uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, but that isn't sent done. I mean, you need to put s to something to write very special code, difficult code, in order to do pattern recognition on this. So at this moment, we're using just human brute force in order to, to look at these spectrograms. And we have detected some things. So as an example, well, these are communications, narrow well, carriers that happens from time to time in, in the spectrum. The dark lines are uh, flagged subbands. So there were two contaminated. So we have just to flag them. We cannot use them. And this here, this, this uh, structure here, is actually a satellite crossing the beam of the telescope. It's a weather satellite that goes just by. And so we, we see it in the, in the, in the data here. Um, here is somebody walking by the telescope without turning off the cell phone. So we put signs everywhere that please turn off the cell phones, but now everybody does it. And at this point, probably it answered a phone call or start WhatsApping around or something like that, because then it gets, it gets 
absolutely saturated everywhere. So, okay, so far we have detected only humans, if you want, uh, but we hope to do more. What we hope? We hope to do, we hope to see something like this at some point. So that, that's the idea. This is a fast radio burst. It's a signal which it's very short in time, as you can see, one second here. It's sweep across the whole spectrum, and uh, this is telling you that it comes from very far away, um, but at the same time, it's very, it's, it's low power. As you can see, it's just a little bit above the noise floor, so not easy to detect. But, well, that's the idea. Uh, this telescope is just getting on the sky, uh, and we estimate that we may be able to detect a couple galactic fast radio bursts per year. So it's a long shot. It's a high risk, uh, long shot project, but also a cheap one. So it's, it's a thing you can do just for fun, if you want. Okay, in summary, um, YAMA Band 2 plus 2 development is progressing well. Uh, it will provide a powerful and versatile receiver, as I said, with a state of, beyond a state of the art, I must say, bandwidth and sensitivity. And this is an important point, and to take full advantage of the receiver is so wide band in RF and in IF that actually is wider than what ALMA digitizers can process. So in future, if you can have wider digitizers, you can take even more advantage of, of this receiver. And uh, intensive use of real-time digital signal processing allows new capabilities for future centimeter wave radio telescope, like this project I just showed you. And interesting niches lay in an explored region of the telescope parameter space. So maybe discoveries waiting to be found. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the presentation, Ricardo. Questions for Ricardo? This art project is a small version of bingo, in a sense. Isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, my question is, if you just track the galactic center, right? Uh -huh. All right. And then you do uh, the waterfalls for the, for the regions of the sky. I think you, you are working on an algorithm to, to do the same thing with the bingo outcomes, but with a much larger integration time, as we discussed yesterday. Right. I think we might uh, have some uh, information exchange and uh, we could discuss the, the algorithm because it's pretty much ready, we want to test it. Yes. That might be a way to, to, to work together and see if our algorithm works in your, uh, in your uh, automated selection, let's say. Right, actually, since, since your telescope is a transit telescope, you will be passing just by the galaxy from time to time, a couple times per day probably, you will be on the galaxy. So we will have overlapping beams a couple of, a couple of times per day. So it just happened by, by chance that a fast radio burst happens at that moment, we will have it both in the data. So it will be very interesting to, to do. Mm -hmm. uh, no, sorry. <laughs> My question is simple. Uh, the cartridge, the bull box where you feed the cartridge, uh -huh. Can fit only one cartridge per time? No, no, ten cartridges. Ten cartridges together. Oh, yeah. okay. But only use one at a time. Uh. But it's not a restriction of the front end. It's a actually a restriction of the back end. So it's, it's, this, it's the ADCs, the digital, the digitizers, mm. the ones that cannot digitize more than, than one band. But also two bands will be pointing different places in the sky. So this is another problem. Mm -hmm. But uh, but actually, the bottleneck, if you want, in Alma, is not the front end, it's the back end. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the, when you need to swap the cartridge, you need to do uh, everything manually. Someone needs to go there and swap it, or the swap is no, not necessary at all? Not necessary, because Alma has only 10 bands, no more. So you put those 10 bands, and you use them for a year or so. So you don't, you don't have to break the vacuum until you do some maintenance. So the swapping, when, when you want to observe with a different band, you just select the different band. The, but all the bands are inside the, the crystal all the time. Ricardo, um, Alma is planning to use band uh, three, 2 plus 3. And in that case, they will have one cartridge uh, for another band. Do you know? Yes, exactly. 
So they, they, well, they used band three, of course, from the beginning. Was the first light band for Alma. They, they, they did the commissioning and site verification with band, with mostly with band three. But they are, they will install band two now, and the band two will cover also band three. So they will have redundancy at this moment. They will have band two and three. So it will be free. I mean, will fret the the band three slot, and there is discussion about what to do with it. But uh, nobody knows uh, at this time. Yeah, well, it could be. It could be. But the, the thing is that when you look at the statistics, actually, how much Banda has actually op Exactly. Yeah. So that's the point. So, and, and actually, Band 9, it has been a headache to, to make it work well in interferometry because it's not just the atmospheric transmission, but also, also the atmospheric stability. Because in, in interferometry, you have to have good phase stability be between all the telescopes in the valley. So actually, People said like kind of a band 11, but uh, when, when you go down to the numbers, say, okay, we will, we will invest a lot of money for very few days of observation. Mm. So it's a point. What is the angular resolution of this last uh, instrument you mentioned? It's, it's actually not very, I mean, the beam is very large. It's, it's 20 degrees per 60 degrees, so it's, it's huge. The angular resolution is given by the direction of arrival finding algorithm. So it's, it's, it's not related to the analog part, but related to, to that algorithm. Mm -hmm. And that algorithm is, it, it produces a better estimation of the direction of arrival if the signal is strong. So if you are many, many sigmas above the noise floor, you can have sub-degree uh, estimation. But if you are like, about the same level of the noise, so one, one sigma, or uh, I mean about the same level, then your error grows to several degrees. Oh, so yeah, it, it's, it's kind of a help, but it's, it won't pinpoint the source at a very, very good level. It's yeah, I, I, uh, since you have an uh, excellent uh, time resolution, I was wondering if it could be used to say study uh, double pulsars, things like that, that can constrain relativity gravitational waves, other things like that. Yes, no, unfortunately, it, the, it, it won't pinpoint the source with that level of resolution. To have a, a very high angular resolution in these frequencies, you have to do really BLBI. But it is possible, huh? so if, if we have a dump, as an example, if you guys have a dump of your, of your telescope, and we also have a dump at the same, at the same time, of course, uh, and we go with this data, and we do post-processing of cross-correlating those data, then we could pinpoint the position of that particular FRV mm -hmm. with sub-microsecond accuracy or something like that. It's a well, kind of interferometer. Yeah, exactly. But mm -hmm. e every s single telescope uh, cannot do more than a few yes. degrees. Thank you. Mm. More questions? You mean for the fast radio burst experiment? No, or what, you know, any, any projects say at one gigahertz, two band L band C, does it work with this band? Well, the, the, the fast radio burst receiver is between one and two gigahertz. So that one will fit that, that description. It's phase array, right? It's not, it's not actual it's, it's hardware part. No, it's phase array, okay. exactly. It's phase array. Um, but the receiver, the receiver the is, is. The front end is one to two gigahertz. Okay. And well, of course, the back end is whatever. It's, uh, actually, the back end goes direct, di direct uh, digitalization. So we have no mixer. So you use a ROAD 2? We uh, use a ROAD 2 for this one. And we use uh, ADCs in the third Nyquist zone. So we don't need a mixer. We just go straight digitize in the sky. Uh, so this is the only project we have at those uh, low frequencies. Then we jump to <coughs> band 1, which is uh, 35 to 50 gigahertz, and then to band 2 plus 3. More questions for Ricardo? So thank you very much, thank Ricardo. You. And now we have the talk of Emiliano Rastock from Instituto Argentino de Radioastronomia, who will talk with us about the optical system for millimeter and submillimeter, uh, 12 meter aperture. That's the dilemma. <laughs>
Well, okay. Um, hello to everyone. <coughs> My name is Emiliano Rastoque, mechanical engineer from the Instituto Argentino de Radioastronomía, where I'm in charge of the mechanical department. And today I will uh, present to you an overview of the optical system to be implemented in the radio Yama telescope. Uh, a system in which I've been working since the year 2017 as an AIB, Assembly Integration and Verification Engineer for the reduced version of the optical system, which is going to be implemented in the first uh, light of the, of, of the project. And since the year 2020, working on the optomechanical design to complete the full system for the long-term operations of the telescope. So briefly, we will see something about the Shama Radio Telescope. I won't stop too much there. Jacques uh, gave a good presentation about the telescope. Something about the receivers that uh, Ricardo also complemented in, in his talk. So we will see in more detail the optical system, which for Shama is called NACOS. And as I said, it's divided in, in two, let's say, different versions, a reduced one for first light and the complete one for long term. I won't say too much about the telescope, the Shama, only to mention that it was already mentioned, but it's important for our talk, that uh, the telescope has three cabins, the receiver cabin below the main reflector and two NASMIT cabins on the sides, cabin A and cabin B, available for installation of uh, detectors or, or cameras or whatever. Something important to mention here, these are the parameters that fully characterize the optical behavior of the telescope. It's a, a, a Cassegrain telescope, but what is important to mention here is that the system focuses the signal coming from, from the sky on a focal plane that is located behind the main reflector and inside the Cassegrain cabin. We will see later why this is important. Well, this is not necessary now. So moving to the receivers, uh, Ricardo presented with good detail uh, and talk about the receivers. So I here will only mention that um, at early stages of the project, it was decided that Shama would use ALMA-like receivers for the long-term operations covering these frequency ranges that are listed here in this chart, which corresponds to this identification of bands. Band one originally was band three. Now the option is to install the band two plus three that Ricardo presented. And band five in, cas in cabin B and bands six, seven, and nine for cabin A. Okay, so the concept is the same as, as for ALMA, but there are some differences. The receivers are installed again in cryostats. These are, uh, this is a, a 3D model of, of the cryostat that will be used uh, in Shama. Each cryostat allows the installation of three receivers. You see here the cold part of the receiver, the warm, the cold cartridge and the warm cartridge of the receivers. And for the long-term operations, one of each, uh, one cryostat on each cabin with three receivers each will be installed, which is very important to remark here and why the existence of NACOS is that the difference between ALMA and SHAMA is that ALMA has its cryostat located in the Cassegrain cabin and the system, the, the beam coming from the sub-reflectors sub is pointed to the receivers according with the tilt of the sub reflector. In our case, it was decided that the Cassegrain cabin will remain free for further instrumentation, for example, cameras. So it is very important to couple the focus produced by the Cassegrain system into the focus of each receiver inside the um, cryostat. So here the need of counting with a tertiary optic system and the appearance of NACOS. Okay, so NACOS, acronym of NASMIT Cabin Optical System, as I mentioned, is the system in charge of remachining the antenna focal plane into the NASMIT cabins. 
As I also mentioned, it was decided to split this system in two phases, one reduced version for the first light phase, which consists on the, the installation of uh, receivers of band 5, 6, and 9 in the cabin B, and a, an update or upgrade version with the installation of bands 1, 2, plus 3, and 5, so band 6 and 9 are removed from cabin B and installed together with band 7 in the cabin A. Okay, so uh, regarding to the NACOS for first light, it was uh, designed as a frequency independent system for, by Dr. Jacob Coy from Caltech, something like four or five years ago. Um, the system, as, as I said, it's a frequency independent system. This is obtained by the use of a Gaussian beam telescope formed by, by these two curved mirrors. The, par the particularity of this system, the, the Gaussian beam telescope, is that the distance between the two mirrors must be equal to the addition of their focal lengths. And this is very important because uh, with a frequency independent system, the, no matter the, the frequency of the signal, it's, the, the signal is always focused in the same place uh, with the same magnification. This is very important because it uh, gives um, to the system the flexibility of uh, changing uh, receivers with not, without the need of changing the optical system. So, this is a view of the 3D model for the first light version of NACOS. Here you see the, the structure to be installed in the Cassegrain cabin. This structure is holding this set of mirrors. We will see it in, in the next slide with more detail. The structure installed in the, NAS, in the NASMIT B cabin, which depending on the on the receiver, there's a lot of different mirrors on the optical path. The cryostat below with the uh, receivers. So this is the concept of, of, the, of the system. The beam path, the beam coming from the sub-reflector of the telescope after passing for the uh, Cassegrain focal plane that I showed in some slides ago, is reflected in this common mirrors, and the signal is uh, redirected towards the NAS-B structure, where later the M4 mirror, the one that, if you remember, formed the Gaussian beam telescope together with M3, redirects the signal downwards. And there, a series of movable mirrors will allow the user to select between uh, observing with band Five, six, or nine. Whoa. <laughs> okay. So I, I will try to, to go faster. Something important to mention for the long-term operations of, of, this, of the telescope, this flat mirror could be replaced by a polarizer grid, so allowing the system to have simultaneous observations in one polarization per band. So reflecting one polarization and transmitting the other one to the other bands. Another important thing to mention here is that also this flat mirror could be replaced by a dichroic filter, so uh, producing the reflection of lower frequencies and the transmission of the higher ones, so again producing uh, simultaneous observations uh, in both cabins. I will show a chart at the end. So. Uh, NACOS for first light was manufactured in the city of Araraquara between the years 2017 and 2018 by, uh, in a metallurgical company called Alpha. Here you see some pictures of the evolution in the manufacturing process of the CAS structure, NAS-B structure, some of the mirrors, some of the equipment necessary for the AV activities that began after the system was uh, completely completed sorry we 
performed three different uh, campaigns of AAV activities in Araraquara. Sadly, the situation was put in a kind of, in a kind of standby due to the COVID uh, situation, but luckily we are again on the road and in the next two weeks in November, we will complete the fourth and last stage of the AV process of the system. So the system will be let, left ready to be transported to Argentina when the project uh, decides. So we, in few words, what we did in the AV uh, process beyond uh, verifi verifying all the parts, all the assemblies, interfaces, etc., was to test the procedure that we developed for installation of the system in the telescope, which is something uh, not trivial. Here on the left, you can see some pictures, a sequence of pictures of the test that we perform in a, with a dedicated card that we designed for the purpose. This is necessary because I think, Jacques, you mentioned something. To introduce the cast on the cast iron cabin is a, something very difficult because of the tiny door existing on, on the cabin. This is 1.1 meter by 1.5 meters, I think. So we tested our card to, to do this job. Then we test the procedure of installation the cast in a dedicated uh, fixture design to simulate the Cassegrain space environment and its interfaces for the system. So we were able to successfully test our procedure, something very similar performed on the NASB structure for the NASMIT B cabin. For example, here testing the system, the, the, the response of the system holding the, the weight of the cryostat and um, receivers. Another very important thing, two minutes. <laughs> another, <laughs> I'm close to finish. Uh, another very important part of the activities of the AV uh, process was the optical alignment of the mirrors. I forgot to mention, but the system has a total of seven mirrors per receiver. Some of them are common for the, for the receivers, but it was a big piece of work the alignment of all these mirrors. This was accomplished by using a, a laser beam, reflecting it on the centers of each mirror and introducing a lot of gadgets and things with holes just to keep always the beam in the uh, coincident with the optical system of, of NACOS. So this was also very hard activity, but with a successful result. Two more minutes. Um, okay, so now NACOS for, for long term. This is the, the, the update version of, of the system. I, I, I took the responsibility of the design, of, of the optomechanical design of the system. I was able also to design a system uh, frequency independent for cabin A. In this case, not using only two mirrors because we have a very strong reduction on, on the optical path in, in this side due to the existence of uh, the elevation encoder. But it was possible to do it with three mirrors. So the system, in few words, needs for each receiver, the beam needs to be reflected in six mirrors, the three curved ones, and three flats to accommodate the beam to the receivers. In the case of uh, the cabin B configuration, the system will remain the same, only some flat mirrors need to be uh, reaccommodated, in particularly for band two plus three, and in the case of band one, with the addition of two flat mirrors more, to fold even more the beam is a really wide beam and needs to be reflecting many times. Uh, this is the 3D model of the full version, where you see now the CAS structure, the NAS B and NAS A with their cryostats. The list of mirrors are here in this chart. I, I won't stop there. 
Okay, so now how the, work, how the system works, very similar with the first live version, but with the difference that here, one option could be to have a, a high pass dichroic filter, so reflecting up to band five towards cabin B and transmitting the beam for higher frequencies and being reflected by this mirror towards cabin A. Same configuration, more or less same configuration that for first slide. The only difference, as I explained, is just to replace some of the flat mirrors here to be able to um, redirect band one and band two plus three to the receivers in the case of cabin A. Um, after the bin is reflected by M2A mirror, another dichroic filter could be installed here. So reflecting the lower band, band six, towards its receiver, and then by the use of a rotating mirror, the user could select between bands seven and nine. If there's no dichroic here, the system just have a reflection here with a rotating mirror selecting between the three bands. So this is, these are possibilities depending on the, the final decisions of, of the project. So all in all, the simultaneous observation capabilities of the system as I presented, without giving too much details, but saying that depending on the um, active mirrors or, or those mirrors that can be moved in or out of the optical system in each structure, like CAS, NAS B or NAS A, these observation configurations are possible where 2P means that the receiver is capable of observing in the two uh, polarization states, 1P is only one polarization. So you see that, that there are a lot of flexibility for the system for simultaneous observations. Well, this is how we expect to see the system once installed in, in Chama. Another, the last thing I want to, to say is that in the, sorry, 15 minutes for such a complex system is, is really short. No, but this is very important because we are not only, in the next two weeks in Araraquara, it's very important for us because we will complete the, the activities for the first live version of the system. As I said, it will be ready to be transported to Argentina at some moment. But also because we will give the first step in the manufacturing of the of, uh, equipment for the long-term configuration, and this is the case of this mirror with its uh, robotic arm. This is the one, if you remember, that reflects the signal towards cabin A, and this is also important not only for the long-term version of NACOS, but because with this mirror it will be possible, for example, the ins to install band 2 plus 3 Temporary, temporarily in the Cassegrain cabin. So this mirror here uh, brings probably many opportunities for new detectors. Last thing I want to say is uh, NACOS, uh, NACOS uh, the development of NACOS was and is possible mainly due to the people and, and institutions listed here of course, FAPESP for uh, their financial support, Professor Jacques Lepin for his management, the director of my instit institution, Gustavo Romero, for um, allowing me to share a big fraction of my work in time on the development of, of this system, the alpha people, the, the true wizards on this, they. Of course, they are the ones that transform drawings, models, and, and ideas in real hardware. And um, finally, my friend, Carlos Ferminio, to whom I shared a lot of hours and days working in Araquara, countless discussions uh, about designs, uh, models, uh, test ideas, etc. So to all of them, my gratitude. And muito obrigado. Questions? So, 
Let me understand your, so, your table. So, <laughs> I, I, knew, I knew that. Just to understand. This is the most important part <laughs> of it, I know. Just All these understand. possibilities are yes. technically possible. The, 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 yes. the decision is only political and yes. economic? Yes. Okay. This is possible. With the system as I presented, these are the, the options for uh, simultaneous observations. Yes. Yes, always, always. Dichroic in the Cassegrain cabin, to have simultaneous observations in two cabins at the same time, but then a dichroic in cabin A, to have simultaneous observations there, and a polarizer in cabin B, to have this simultaneity. Optically? Yes. Uh, uh, yes, we had some this conversations with Cardiff people some months ago. They were willing to uh, make contact with the project to provide the dichroics. In fact, they have dichroic to be to to install here. Um, the dichroic that they, they propose, this is just, it's a, it's, a, it's a place that needs to be more uh, investigated or developed, but they could provide a dichroic here, which could ref reflect the beam until band five and transmitting bands six and seven, and luckily we will de have a big degradation in band nine. But then another option is using a, a, a decroic here, just transmitting band nine and reflecting all the others. Of course, you will not be able to see bands up to band five because the receivers will be on the other side. The, the CAS system is ready to have simultaneously two uh, dichroics filters. This was also the, the I mean, the, mechan the mechanical part is already built and was tested, uh, Carlos program its movements and yes. yes. I know, I know. Let what? <laughs> okay. No, no, no. Oh. No. no, what I want to ask is the, uh, have you calculated how much uh, uh, signal do you lose in the reflections and how the beam it will be changed by the reflections. Yes, it's calculated, not here. It's part of my thesis. I have all the calculations. But what I can say is basically you can consider almost a perfect reflection and a per I mean perfect half of the part transmitted, the other half is is not. But you you don't have um, a degradation on the uh, optical performance of the system. May I add something? <laughs> this, I think, is one of the reasons why the system for first life, because in fact, there's no documentation explaining why for first life the design contemplates a polarizer grid instead of a dichroic. So if you see for simultaneous observations on cabin B, it's reduced to only one polarization. So at some moment, if you, if you want to see in the opposite, uh, in the orthogonal polarization, you need to send a guy just to rotate the, the polarizer 90 degrees. Probably it has to do with the size of the beams in this uh, cabin, which are so wide that I believe that the, the, constra the mechanical constraints mainly to keep the dichroic flat enough is a challenging matter. I, I'm, I'm not sure. Yes, sure. When in the dichroic in the Cassegrain cabin, it's okay because you are splitting bands that are far away. Yes. But when you want to split bands that are together, like uh, they have no gap between the bands, then you you cannot use a dichroic. Or if you use a dichroic, you have to be, I mean, you, uh, yes. you have to be able to spoil the a big part of the band. Yes. Well, 
Yes, exactly. Probably this is the reason. Mm, it has to do with the near and far field of, of the beam close to the, I imagine, close to the reflection on the on the decroid. Well, it's, it's pretty much like a filter. So you always yeah. have a drop off in which uh, the performance is not good. Mm. Yes. But it's not like a filter that if you put many, many poles or if you make the filter larger, you can improve that cutoff frequency. In the decroid, you cannot do that. You, yeah. you always have the yes. role of this difficult to fix. But as I said, thi these are opportunities. Regarding band nine, did you band uh, uh, yeah in in the, the mirrors for band nine, are you planning to gold plate them or is uh, you, you believe this is not necessary? I think it's not necessary because I, I at this point I don't have a requirements for that or reasons to do that. In fact, the, the ones that are part of the first light, bar, first light will have band nine uh, operative. Those mirrors were specified without any any plate or any treatment on the mirror. Okay. You think it's uh, something to? I mean, Alma mirrors are gold plated for for higher bands. Uh, I mean, Alma mirrors are gold plated for band three and four. Uh, but it might might have been an overkill. You, you you never know. I mean, I haven't seen the numbers, but um, I think it's worth to do the calculation if no. pure aluminium doesn't absorb too much at band nine frequencies. I don't know. Really no, no, no. It's, open, it's, open it's good to know. It, first time I, I I hear that. Yeah, but yes, it's it's important to know. So let's thank you again, Emilia. <laughs> And now, our next speaker is Danilo Zanella. Danilo é do grupo da IAG USP, do grupo de computação do Olhama. E ele vai nos falar sobre o projeto do Olhama Micro ABM, que é uma solução que está sendo desenvolvida localmente para agilizar a integração de software uh, dos subsistemas do Olhama. Olá, boa tarde. Tá bem? É, bom, antes de navegarmos por esses, esses mares é, é, desconhecidos, é, eu quero agradecer a oportunidade de poder aqui novamente falar, e são principalmente o GIG, por incentivar a, a, a apresentação desse trabalho. Bem, é, meu nome é Danilo, trabalho no IAG, trabalho para o Lhama desde 2012, principalmente na área de, de computação do, do Lhama. É, tenho me envolvido em outros subsistemas, é, que eu vou comentar futuramente. Bom, eu vou falar um pouco sobre alguns conceitos que envolvem esse, esse desenvolvimento. Vou falar uma breve história, por que a gente está chegando nessa questão da micro ABM. Falar um pouco sobre o hardware, o software e, finalmente, algumas considerações. Bom, é, então, primeira coisa, por que falar do Alma agora? Né? Bom, é, acho que já foi comentado pelo Jax, pelo Emiliano, é, o próprio Ricardo Finger também já comentou. É, o, bom, o Lhama, o sistema de controle do Lhama, ele é baseado é, no, no Alma. Então, por que isso? Porque, bom, nós temos uma, a mesma antena que, é, que foi desenvolvida pela Vertex, nós temos... É, praticamente o, os mesmos equipamentos de front-end, ou seja, os receptores de banda 5 e banda 9, e futuramente o, o receptor de banda 6, além de é, equipamentos acessórios, por exemplo, é, é, que estão associados a, esses, a esse front-end, por exemplo, é, power supply, é, warm components para cada uma dessas bandas, é, outros equipamentos associados, tipo geradores de, é, do oscilador lo local, é, e também, finalmente, o software. Bom, o software foi, foi gentilmente é, cedido para nós em 2014, e, e ele foi desenvolvido através desse framework que o próprio Alma desenvolveu, chamado 
a uma Common Software, que é esse acrônimo aqui. Então, ele, esse ACS, que é, nós frequentemente usamos como acrônimo, ele, ele é baseado numa, num outro framework chamado Corba, e esse framework ele disponibiliza a execução dos componentes do, do Alma de forma distribuída, ou seja, você pode ter diversos componentes rodando em uma network como se fosse é, dentro de um único sistema. Mas, bom, temos também algumas diferenças. Então, no caso do Llama, é, ele, em princípio, não vai operar da mesma forma interferométrica que o Alma opera, é, com correlacionadores e, e equipamentos associados. A gente vai ter, muito mais parecido com o Apex, é, é, não, não exatamente, mas é, é, com as cabines laterais é, mostradas pelo Emiliano através do NACUS e com as, essa possibilidade de observação em bandas simultâneas. Bom, e outras diferencinhas a mais, como eu vou mostrar aqui. Aqui é outra questão que eu estou tentando responder também, é, é, relacionada ao trabalho, que é onde está localizada a famigerada ABM que é o que eu vou comentar agora. Bom, essa aqui é a arquitetura é, física é, aproximada do Alma, tá? tem muitos detalhes aqui que estão suprimidos, mas basicamente ela é dividida em dois pontos aqui. É, a 2.800 metros nós temos o, a, o Operating Site Facility, onde é, está localizada a sala do operador e todo o sistema de controle, ou grande parte do sistema de controle e o sistema de archiving. E depois, no alto da montanha, que é o Alma Operating Site, é, onde, está, onde estão localizadas as antenas, propriamente dito. Nós temos centralizado no Alma o, a parte do correlacionador, que está aqui mais localizado em cima, ou seja, e os seus componentes, acessórios. E aqui mais abaixo, toda uma geração de tempo e frequência. Ou seja, eles geram é, centralmente um sinal de oscilador local, e distribuem o tempo através de fibras óticas para todas as 66 antenas. Aqui nós temos o diagrama de uma das antenas, aproximado, nós temos outras 50 é, antenas é, distribuídas no sítio, e mais 16 no Compact Array. E, bom, dentro dessas antenas, nós temos diversos equipamentos que compõem o front-end, o back-end e outros equipamentos associados. É, por exemplo, eu vou falar aqui basicamente da CU também e da famigerada ABM. Então, a ABM ela está localizada em cada uma das 66 antenas. E, bom, vou entrar aqui em detalhe agora um pouco mais. Então, então aqui nós temos o que é a ABM em si. É, bom, cada... Cada antena então, ela é constituída de diversos componentes, por exemplo, no front-end, como o Ricardo comentou, eles possuem 16 bandas, eh, eh, perdão, 10 bandas de frequência. Essas bandas são conectadas eh, a partir do cold cartridge para o warm, warm cartridge, chegando eh, por um sinal de fibra, de, perdão, de um sinal eh, CAN. Esse CAN é, um, é, uma, é uma sinalização, é eh, um padrão desenvolvido pelo Alma, é, onde ele estende o, o barramento CAN convencional e eles chamam de AMB, é o Alma Monitoring Control Bus. E por isso nós vamos ter aqui a ABM, que é a Antena Bus Master, ou seja, é o controlador principal desse barramento CAN. Então, é, equipamentos do back-end e do front-end são conectados através desse, desse barramento. Na verdade, a ABM pode controlar até seis desses barramentos. Então, por exemplo, outros equipamentos que não estão mostrados aqui, como é, a apresentação da Fátima, que vai falar sobre o, é, o receptor holográfico, que é localizado bem no topo da antena. Então, nós temos um canal CAN que se comunica direto com a ABM. É bom, e o que é a ABM, então? A ABM é um computador que está rodando um sistema operacional em tempo real, e onde o software desenvolvido pelo Alma, ou os componentes de software que respondem em tempo real, estão é, sendo executados. Bom, agora um pouco mais para dentro da ABM. O que é a ABM? Bom, a ABM, como eu falei, é um computador. Ela é, foi desenvolvida em cima dessa plataforma VME, onde nós temos 
aqui um single board computer, basicamente é um, uma arquitetura x86, 64 bits, é, conectada nesse barramento. Aqui nós temos uma outra placa, que é chamada de Industrial, Industry Pack Carrier, que conecta através, é, é, se, que é usada para conectar essa é, entrada paralela. Aqui ela disponibiliza diversos IOs de, por exemplo, a temporização, como eu falei, o, o Alma gera centralizadamente um sinal de, de evento de a cada 48 milissegundos, ou a 20 Hz. É, esse sinal entra através desse canal é, da ABM e isso é, é gerado uma interrupção. Vou comentar isso depois. Né? Bom, conectada na, 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 na single board computer, nós temos também é, a interface CAM. Essa interface CAM, utilizando o flat cable, ela conecta na back panel da ABM e disponibiliza, então, os seis canais AMB. O que são esses seis canais? Bom, são seis é, pares, é, ca cada canal tem dois é, é, sinais diferenciais para o CAM, mais dois sinais diferenciais para cada um do, dos sinais é, de aquisição, por exemplo, o reset e um time event, é, e isso é replicado em cada um dos seis canais. Já? Bem a nossa. Bom... <coughs> É, bom, aqui eu, eu vou mostrar um pouco sobre a ABM do Lhama. Então, ela é baseada nos conceitos do Alma. É um conceito já bem conhecido e está em uso pelo Alma. Uh, então, ela já utiliza o mesmo software é, que foi que está em, em execução pelo Alma. Isso é uma grande vantagem. E, bom, essa daqui é uma ABM que foi desenvolvida no IAR. É, então, ela já, tá, já foi desenvolvida, foi é, montada e testada na Argentina. Quais são ah, os problemas aqui? Ela é um pouco cara, em torno de 15, 20 mil dólares. É, não é facilmente transportada, porque, finalmente, ela não está aqui em São Paulo. <risos> Bom, uma breve história aqui da, da ABM. Vou tentar correr um pouquinho, talvez tenha que passar um minutinho. Aqui foi uma primeira versão que nós fizemos usando um Bigobone e uma placa bem mequetrefe aqui, de certa forma, <risos> para testar a, a ACU, que eu comentei no começo, que é, a, é o computador responsável por controle do movimento da antena, além de outros subsistemas, por exemplo, é, é, locks da antena, é, sensores de, de, de inclinação e por aí vai. Então, ela se comunica através dessa ACU pelo canal CAM, então essa plaquinha, na verdade, faz uma interface entre o Ethernet e o CAM. Nessa placa, especificamente, nós fizemos uma intervenção no software é, para tirar toda a parte de baixo nível, e aí ela opera como um cliente servidor, então todo o comando que era gerado pelo software do Alma é, de mais alto nível passava, era é, é, suprimido e passado diretamente através de, de Ethernet. Então a gente perdia toda a característica de tempo real nesse sistema. Mas dessa, de certa forma não era tão não era o requisito nesse momento, e sim testar toda a IDL, né, a Interface Document Language, da ACU. Bom, isso aqui foi um outro trabalho que nós fizemos é, é, para testar. É, eu fui lá na, na Holanda, no Captain Institute, e é, a ideia era fazer o teste também do front-end, pelo menos dos banda 5 e banda 9. Mas a plaquinha falhou miseravelmente e não deu para testar. Bom, aí, é, agora, esse ano, então, o receptor holográfico chegou em São Paulo, em janeiro, e, e havia uma perspectiva de visitar novamente uh, lá em Groningen o Captain Institute. O uh, que mais? Uh, bom, e com isso, a gente estava demandando por uma ABM, havia uma demanda de, 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 dessa ABM para que a gente pudesse fazer os testes desse, desses subsistemas. Então, ela deveria ser transportável, porque a gente precisava levar para a Holanda ou fazer o teste na Poli, e ela seria o ideal que ela reproduzisse uma ABM real. Bom, agora aqui eu vou falar um pouquinho do hardware dela. Nós compramos essa single board computer, que foi feita por essa empresa aqui, é, para desenvolvimento do telescópio óptico. Essa, essa placa ela possui um, um processador é, ARM, com, é um dual core ARM com 1.3 GB, e uma FPGA que implementava diversos... Port, é, Diversas interfaces, por exemplo, o CAN, eh, RS-232, RS-485, entre outras. Né? Ela também tinha essa, essa capacidade de operar no alto da montanha. E essa aqui é, é a descrição interna dela. Bom, 
ela tem, como eu falei, o processador e o FPGA conectado através de um canal PCI Express. Implementado no FPGA, nós temos toda uma sequência de, de canais RS-232, RS-485, é, é, entradas I.O. aqui, que poderiam ser usadas, por exemplo, para fazer a aquisição de sinais de time event, e, e também um conector P64, que seria o equivalente ao antigo ISA. Né? É, bem, tem, tem, tem. <risos> Bom, então, o, o, quais são o, o, as vantagens dessa ABM? Então, ela, ela é facilmente transportável, é uma caixinha pequena, né? É, e ela é, relativamente é mais barata do que a, da versão, que a versão VME. Ela não tem os problemas de, de solda, de fios e tal, que a gente é, tinha na, nessa versão da ABM. E ela suporta o, o barramento AMB. É, bom, o que eu acho mais interessante aqui, para resumir um pouco, é que ela, ela também tem essa capacidade de operar nos dois modos. Então, por exemplo, a gente pode fazer ela funcionar tanto como uma, uma ABM, ou seja, ela sendo o, o master do barramento, como um dispositivo. Então, para interface, interfacear outros dispositivos, ela poderia ser usada nesse modo device como um, um slave no, no barramento. E, e quais seriam os, soft, os desafios? Se tornar uma, uma ABM real, ou se comportar muito próximo disso. né? Aqui foi o diagrama elétrico que, que foi desenvolvido. É, é, basicamente, ele utiliza o, o canal, é, o, o barramento do, da Single Board Computer, que é o P64, para implementar todas as funções que ele precisa. Aqui um, um diagrama, é, um layout da placa que foi desenvolvido. Algumas, isso aqui tem alguns problemas já que foram identificados. Já estão pensando em uma versão mais nova, onde é, é, novos improvement poderiam ser adicionados, por exemplo, um pouco mais de imunidade a ruído, coisas desse tipo. É, aqui a placa sendo testada. Um pouquinho sobre o software agora. É, então, ela é baseada na versão Linux, no Debian 11. É, ela está usando a versão mais recente do, do Alma, do sistema de controle do Alma, não só do ACS. E como é muito complicado fazer a compilação cruzada, ou seja, fazer a compilação a partir de uma arquitetura para outra, eu resolvi compilar diretamente na, na, na single board computer. Isso levou de três a quatro dias compilando. Né? É, bom, ela utiliza essa versão do kernel 4.19, que foi configurada de forma full preemptive, ou seja, ela opera de forma em, em tempo real, o kernel está preparado para operar em tempo real, e eu, se eu não me engano, posso dizer que esteja falando uma besteira, mas eu acho que é uma versão mais recente que a do, do Alma, nesse momento. É, bom, falando um pouquinho só sobre o, o kernel, o kernel tem dois modos de operação. Um é o modo de usuário e o outro é o modo de kernel. Que é, é, bom, em geral, quando você executa alguma aplicação, você está usando o modo de usuário, que é um pouco mais seguro, ele tem, é, não deixa você fazer grandes besteiras no... No, no processo de programação ou de execução do programa. No modo de mais baixo nível, que é o modo de kernel, qualquer coisa que você faz em termos de é, 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 liberação de memória, ou, ou não, no, não cuidado com a liberação de memória, ou tem que cuidar, é, lidar com condições de, de concorrência ou, 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 é, ou data races, é, você tem que estar mais, mais, é, tomar mais cuidado, que senão o sistema crasha frequentemente. Isso foi uma experiência própria. Bom, é, diversos módulos de kernel tiveram que ser desenvolvidos. Alguns, por exemplo, esse primeiro foi é, que eu desenvolvi para lidar com o, a parte de baixo nível. Então, ele implementa um canal de comunicação PC Express e faz a leitura do time event. É, com isso, ele gera um sinal é, de sincronização para um LED, para dizer que está tudo funcionando, e também é, disponibiliza a leitura do canal CAM. Mais para baixo aqui foram as adaptações que tiveram que ser feitas por módulos desenvolvidos pelo pessoal do Alma. Então, é, o, esse módulo RT Tools, ele disponibiliza algumas funções de conversão, é, identifica prioridades das threads, é, faz log do sistema e, e define alguns semáforos, etc. É, mais uma, um módulo que teve que ser, é, de certa forma, alterado foi esse Time é, Event Handler, que também foi desenvolvido para o Alma. Ele basicamente provê um semáforo de, de sincronização para o time array do, do Alma. Ele tem três modos de operação, que é o software, hard e o free willing. O software, o soft é, na verdade, quando você não tem o sinal de time event sendo provido fisicamente, então ele gera isso artificialmente. O modo hard é quando você tem esse sinal sendo gerado 
é, pelos, pelo, pelo sistema de, 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 de time event, mas, é, eventualmente, ele pode falhar. Então, se houver uma falha nesse sinal, uma desconexão do cabo, um rompimento do cabo, ou, ou houver uma, um deslocamento de fase desse sinal, ele entra nesse modo fill wheeling, que seria uma espécie de soft é, temporário. Eventualmente, na hora que você volta com o sinal, Ah, no modo hard. É, finalmente, a gente tem esse outro módulo, que é o MB Server, que vai cuidar propriamente das comunicações em CAN. Então, ele usa a sincronização do time event, ou seja, existe toda uma, uma, uma inter-relação entre esses módulos, e ele disponibiliza, então, as mensagens CANs é, em FIFOs, para que os sistemas de mais alto nível consigam retirar esses dados. É, bom, finalmente algumas considerações aqui. Então, é, checar se, se existe a necessidade de adaptação de outros kernels, de, de outros módulos de kernel, e planificar uma uma, uma rotina de testes. Para isso, o ideal seria fazer é, uma rotina com um hardware real, em princípio poderia ser usada a CU, que está é, lá no IAG, então é um trabalho futuro, e é, finalmente também fazer um teste com mais alto nível. Então, ou seja, usar uh, os módulos que estão relacionados à, à comunicação com a, a montagem da Vertex, passando por toda a estrutura de software até chegar nesses módulos de kernel e se comunicar diretamente com, com a CU. E, finalmente, uma possibilidade, que será que ela poderia, uma questão em aberto aqui, se ela poderia substituir a, uma ABM real. Uh, é claro que essa... Que essa essa versão ela tem muito menos poder de processamento que uma, uma é, ABM em versão VME, mas talvez seis delas podem ser que sejam capazes. Né? Então, fica em aberto essa questão. Acho que é, seria isso aí. Obrigada, Danilo. Perguntas para o Danilo? Danilo, uma questão muito simples. A gente vai precisar, a gente vai fazer teste de laboratório de holografia sem ABM e depois seria importante usar ABM. Que eu entendi, a gente pode usar a sua ABM. Sim, sim. Quando? Sim. Olha, já está operacional, ela já, já está operacional. É, Muito bom. O que teria que ser feito é uma nova versão dessa placa, porque ela teve alguns erros, alguns problemas na hora de, de, de rotear os hum. sinais. Então, uma nova versão teria que ser feita apenas para acertar isso, deixar de forma mais elegante, mais... É uma excelente Sim. notícia. Obrigada. É. Mais alguma questão para o Daniel? Sim. Sim, sim. Now this is the master component. The, you you set this as a master, and then the slave you need to prepare a specific model to handle the specific uh, how can I say uh, data for the, the that device. For instance, if you need to interface as a power a power uh, a total power equipment, and then you can connect through the master uh, ABM though the ABM to this device using the CAN. Of course, we, we can change for Ethernet or something like that. But if you need, uh, if, you, if we choose the, uh, use the, this micro ABM as a slave, you can program in this uh, hardware, uh, specific signals, tipo like a, 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 a ADC, a specialized ADC, so you need to, to connect to this ABM and then use the same code to communicate to them, to it. Okay. Yes, yes, it's already. Yes, yeah, yeah. Of course, the, uh, as I said, the, the slave has a specific code to a specific device. Right, right. All right. Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For instance, we have another uh, device that we are preparing uh, that is a, a weather station. So it's possible 
to connect this uh, weather station because uh, it uh, is a serial link and then you use the serial link to communicate to this slave uh, ABM, okay, it's a slave device, and then communicate through the AMB using the, the, the ABM itself, okay? Então, vamos agradecer novamente o Danilo. E é, acho que o Gigi tem uns anúncios. Então, é, vamos passar para o intermédio do, do café. E voltamos em 15 minutos. Ok? Tem bolachinha aí com a Lilian. Não.
Vamos começar a última sessão, então, do dia e do workshop. Temos, nesse momento, três últimas apresentações. E depois vamos a fazer um debate que já avisamos a quem nos acompanha pela internet, que não vamos transmitir, até porque não sabemos o que pode ser dito, é melhor editar. <risos> Alguém pode ficar nervoso. Então, uh, eu vou chamar primeiro a Lilian uh, Salazar, que é da Universidade de Concepcion. E ela vai nos falar Development and Characterization of Calibration Loads for Llama. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Lilian Paso Alto. Uh, I'm, I belong to Centro para Instrumentación Astronómica um, de la Universidad de Concepción, CEPIA, de, in Chile. Um, I thank you very much uh, for giving me the opportunity of participating in this workshop. Um, and I talk about the development and characterization of calibration load system for JAMA uh, Radio Telescope. Uh, here I show you the timeline of the project. Uh, the project um, beginning in the 1916, and, uh, and the first uh, calibration loss prototype is finished in uh, 1918. And the same time, and the same time, uh, beginning of the final law system, the fabrication. And uh, then, on the January uh, 2020, uh, the law system fabrication is finished, but uh, the pandemic in from March, uh, we don't work in Chile because all closed uh, here. But in 2021. Uh, we realized all the, uh, infrared tests and radiometric tests of the uh, calibration load system and the um, loads uh, they uh, delivered uh, to uh, YAMA, okay? And in this year, 2022, uh, we hope to finish the project and um, realize to the, uh, the final measurements of uh, radiometric it's important to mention here that the, uh, the project uh, is framed um, an a study, a study environment. Uh, two undergraduate theses uh, were presented uh, for the development prototyping, and one master thesis and one PhD thesis, uh, both in progress now, uh, present, uh, will be present uh, the final uh, development of the calibration loads and that includes of the uh, radiometric test and infrared test. Um, uh, all uh, theses uh, mentioned uh, previously, uh, that we permit uh, create or uh, frame uh, four topics of the project. Uh, the topic one is the prototyping, was divided in design, fabrication, assembly, and uh, infrared test. The topic two is the PID thermal control system to monitor the temperature of the loads. And topic three, uh, data acquisition system between thermal control and JAMA using ACS. And the topic four, uh, build loads and characterizes radiometrically the loads, uh, they will be operated at different temperature in a simultaneous way. Um, here I show you the calibration load system uh, sent to Yama. Uh, the system uh, is composed for three loads. Here is a, a front view and this is a back view. 
Um, the, the loads are the uh, microwave absorbed elements that uh, its uh, physical temperature uh, can change uh, without um, compromise uh, the element from a physical and a mechanical uh, point of view, okay? And here is the control box that will uh, allow the communication between the system uh, control of the loads with the monitoring uh, software of the JAMA. The purpose of the calibration loads is to uh, calibrate the sensitivity of the JAMA receivers um, with the assumption that the physical temperature is equal to radiometric temperature, okay? And implicitly, uh, also we can uh, calibrate the astronomical data and uh, if is required, uh, we need to realize the performance of receivers uh, continually. And to create the prototype pin, uh, we took uh, account the JAMA requirements first, and the all requirements, we can take the main of, of uh, objectives is uh, useful, is to create useful absorbers, stabilization temperature over time. But uh, considering this, uh, we uh, uh, first thing uh, we thought is a black body encapsulated. Um, but uh, what um, all these uh, requirements, uh, more uh, plus uh, the adequate materials, we can, uh, we can make a, a black body that, that the, uh, que cumpla con las uh, uh, objectives of, of the JAMA, okay? Um, the main material of the, black, of the loads are these pieces, calling Teka Ram. Um, the Teka Rams are made of the popul uh, polypropylene. Um, they have um, this um, high uh, density of pyramids. Uh, but the aim uh, is to increase absorption uh, of the waves and reduce the reflectivity on the incoming waves. Uh, you can see two sides of the, um, the tiles. Um, the square size is for uh, one range of frequency. Uh, uh, the frequency cover over uh, 80 gigahertz, and the uh, bigger uh, tiles cover a frequency to uh, over um, 40 gigahertz. And uh, also, uh, this material is uh, useful for cryogenic operations. And after uh, then many, many, uh, many tests, uh, the uh, prototype of calibration load is here. And the main material is the take around that see here in black color. We use the uh, small uh, loads for create this prototype. Um, and we need that the uh, take around to stabilize in the time. Uh, for this, we cover the front of the tecaram with a, a mylar film uh, because uh, the mylar uh, have the property that is transparent in the microwave and uh, permit that the uh, abode um, convection uh, between in the inside of the load uh, to the outside of the environment. And then uh, we use other materials um, that is so important uh, to encapsulate this uh, black body. Uh, we use uh, the judocotton uh, ring, uh, outer cell uh, pins, um, mineral goods, and um, all these uh, materials will have a low thermal conductivity. Okay. And here, uh, I can um, you can uh, uh, I can show the uh, final loads uh, give to Yama the last year, the last years. Um, the these uh, loads uh, are governed by, uh, for the uh, prototype uh, shown above. The only difference is these uh, two uh, loads. Uh, made uh, with a uh, large take-around and the, 
and the uh, small load uh, we create with a small check around. And it's important to know that uh, three loads, uh, we have a um, maximum setting temperature to 60, gradios, uh, 60 degrees Celsius. And uh, the small load always will be used to um, a hot load. And the other two loads uh, we can use with a hot load or ambient load, uh, with uh, well, uh, whatever you, you want. Okay. And uh, regarding to connection between the temperature system, uh, control system, and ACS, um, I'm not uh, I'm expert in this team. It's not my uh, area, but uh, broadly speaking. Uh, uh, we have a um, PID control system uh, that we use uh, for uh, calibration low system temperature. This control strategy um, was optimized for uh, to reach um, the maximum temperature in uh, 10 minutes. That is a requirement of JAMA in the moment. In that moment. And, and the control uh, and that strategy is implemented in a FPGA board. And the FPGA board communicates with the Raspberry Pi. And then um, that once is uh, contained the uh, uh, skippy commands that communicate with the ACS software. Okay. And uh, we have the calibration load test. Um, we made the infrared test. We use that um, infrared camera, calling Govi is a 40 giga. And the sensitivity of the camera is uh, 50 millikelvin. And we uh, realized uh, two uh, procedures of measurements um, with three loads with no mylar and three loads with mylar. And really, that interesting now uh, us is uh, the the measurements of the width miler that is uh, how the the loads uh, will be used. Okay, but uh, we can we can see that the temperature with miler is minus of the calibration uh, loads with without miler. That is because our miler is. Um, as uh, no transparent of the infrared, okay? And when, when we made these uh, measurements, we take a data, and we can uh, infrared temperature of the three lows with mylar, we set uh, to 70 Celsius degrees for three days. Uh, it does include day and night. And uh, we can see that the three lows uh, have a different temperatures. Uh, that is, is the average temperature of the old uh, three days. And uh, we can uh, see that the, the standard deviation of the three lows are the less than uh, one Celsius degree. So that is good. But uh, we can say that the three lows are um, established in, in the time. Um, that uh, stabilized the physical is stabilized, okay? And uh, also we made the radiometric characterization. This is more the important proof. Uh, we use a receiver and the loads. And the measurements were independent in the loads, okay? Uh, we use a total power receiver at 90 gigahertz. Um, uh, the receiver is composed to the one feed on, three lows, no amplifier supplied by JPL, and a one power meter that to power uh, that measure the power of the of the uh, on surface of the Tekka RAM. Okay. Uh, also, we uh, realize uh, hot cold measurements uh, manually, and we uh, obtain the receiver temperature of the 66 uh, 100. Uh, 650 kelvins, and the result. Uh, what um, we need to know, or we want to know, uh, how long takes 
of the calibration logs uh, gives oh no, um, arrive the, the uh, stability, but in brightness temperature, no frequent, no physical temperature. And so the the other of the this measure, uh, we obtain the three curves of the three loads. Um, we need uh, the stabilization curve is the red line, okay, is a fit of the data. And uh, we can say the, the stabilization times for the three data is not the same. So the small load only uh, take, uh, arrive the uh, stabilization time to in, in, in 30 minutes. And the other, that the, the large loads, um, takes uh, more time, okay? And the, uh, the brightness temperature also is uh, less than the physical temperature of the, of the calibration dose in that moment, okay? And this value uh, is, uh, takes um, when considered that the, um, the loads are stabilized. And here, uh, present the radiometric temperature of the three loads again, uh, set to 70 uh, Celsius degrees, but over the time, okay? Uh, this was a uh, one hour uh, um, before uh, the, the loads had uh, on. And these uh, measurements were, this measurement uh, was for uh, seven days. Six, uh, six, seven days, and takes uh, different hours, okay? Um, this four column show uh, the average temperature, um, average temperature for the 70 uh, degrees Celsius, and we realize the procedure for the other temperatures of 40 degrees, 50 degrees, um, Obviously, the, the, the brightness temperature uh, of different, and also we can say we can see in the three case the brightness temperature is minus of the physical temperature. Okay, and what more? Um, we can say the the brightness temperature is not uh, more than stable uh, of the infrared test. We can say. Uh, but why, why, um, why occur uh, that? Por qué ocurre esto? Um, we think it's because uh, a gain variation of the receiver. Okay, uh, we think that the receiver in that moment uh, uh, we have a, a receiver temperature uh, very large, so maybe uh, that produced that the. The power data, um, we have a, a very variability, okay, in the time. So these are represented in the brightness temperature. But um, for a continually analyze, uh, analyze uh, this measurement, we uh, can, we take, we, we made a, a new measurements that the future work in the next days we can use a new form of the, uh, take the data that is known manually with the last year. Uh, we can make the measurements with uh, automate the system and with a new receiver, okay? So uh, the only element we moved is this, is a, a mirror that is motorized. And the, and the uh, that mirror uh, takes uh, a specific angles that uh, uh, allowed that the um, receiver uh, capture the radiation of the hot loads or the nitrogen box or here here is a uh, very there is a uh, ambient load okay so uh, we we think that uh, this uh, new type of measurements uh, reduce the errors in the measure in the measurements yes um, maybe uh, we can obtain uh, better um, results. Uh, that's no need. Uh, but this is all team calibration laws in Universidad de Concepcion. Um, thank you very much.
Perguntas, questions? So, ah, tem uma? Uh, very quick questions. So I'm curious about when you show the, the temperature of the, the brightness temperature against the physical temperature. Did you check for linearity of that change or how hot the, the, the physical temperature is compared to the brightness temperature? So you have that 30, 40, and 50, I think. Uh -huh. Did you uh, check for that variation? Is a linear change? Is a uh, uh, I proved that. Uh, I not get the linearity with that temperatures. Yeah. I, I don't know if this is. I'm just curious if you check if there's a, some yeah, linearity I, there on the. Uh, let me see, I understand very well. Uh, um, yeah, this, this one, yes, oh, this okay. one. Uh, you can, uh, you say me that if I prove that the this and three temperatures uh, give me a, a linear. Uh, Yes, if yes. how uh, yes. no no maybe no. might be might <laughs> yes. be interesting to check just see yes. uh, nice I proof uh, but no no give me the uh, that linearity. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Mais alguma pergunta? Quiere decir, ¿por qué hay dos calientes de distinto tamaño? ¿Es para el tamaño de los beams? De eh, sí, tiene que ver con eso, pero es algo... A ver, las cargas, por ejemplo... De hecho, de teca rams pequeñas. Eh, y eh, en realidad la carga chica tiene un mejor rendimiento en las temperaturas eh, altas que las cargas grandes. Entonces, para yo poder caracterizar un receptor, necesito que mi delta de temperatura, que es eh, cuando yo dije que quería caracterizar la sensibilidad del receptor, tiene que ser muy, muy alto. Y, lo me y la, la, el mejor rendimiento que obtengo es con esta carga. Esta carga... Como ya lo había mostrado acá, eh, bueno acá, eh, me da que a 70 grados Celsius, eh, perdón, me da que desde temperatura ambiente, cuando yo la seteo a 70, llega una temperatura eh, de brillo de 61. En cambio con las otras llega una temperatura menor. Entonces el delta de temperatura no es tan alto. Por lo tanto, eh, el factor Y en mi método es, eh, no es tan bueno. Entonces yo busco siempre que sea una diferencia de temperatura alta. Gente, vamos agradecer de novo a Lilian e passamos agora para a próxima.